And now, I already had the unenviable task of, hey John, tell everyone about what's going on at the university, and you have like 10 or 15 minutes because we have to go to the parade. Okay, no pressure. Then we're sitting up here in the beginning and Aaron leans over to me and says, have you ever given a speech in front of a bunch of communications professors? <laughs> that hadn't occurred to me before, so I think she got an A+. Plus. We'll see how I do. I'm not so confident about this, but that's okay. But there's lots going on and lots to share. I wanted to start with this weird picture. Uh, this is a picture of the day lilies behind um, Towers Hall, by the entrance of what had been the library back there. And it's at the end of season, so they're not the most beautiful flowers. There's only a few of them left or whatever in this picture. But I took this picture because I was not planful enough to do it last spring. I watched this spot in the end of February, beginning of March, at the end of what can be, let's just be honest, long, cold, gray Ohio winters because the first shoot of green on campus is in this spot. I figured that out. The first little green shoot happens right there with those flowers. And it gives me a little bit of hope that we're almost through the gray cold winter. And it's a reminder too of renewal. Those flowers come back every year. They're a little different every year, right? They might grow a little different. They're not exactly the same every year, but they do come back every year. And it's a reminder to me of the renewal of the university. And so watch that spot if you're ever on campus at the end of winter, because that's what will happen. It's much like the rest of campus, right? There are some things that are always there. Towers Hall will hopefully always be there. But what happens around it is always changing, right? The plants, the people, everything happening around it is evolving and changing. I had another president, once I stole their, I'm stealing their line, and I'm giving them credit, that said, uh, you know, if you're not growing, evolving, and changing, you're dying. And so this place is always growing, evolving, and changing in its own ways. But what's center, central to it, something like Towers Hall, shouldn't change as we go. Part of that change is the campus center. There are physical changes on campus, right? If you go over to the campus center, you will notice a new facade, a new elevator that actually goes to all three floors, new bathrooms on every floor, new entrance lobbies. This is the exterior as you go. My favorite, at the top left, it looked for a moment like we were gonna build a multiplex. Doesn't it seem like there should be movie listings up there? <laughs> That was an option, I guess it's a little late for a multiplex, but you know, it could have happened. And on the inside, we have some new lounges, entrances to the dining hall, a variety of social spaces, but it's just a fraction of the building. It's the first of several phases to get this done. And so you'll notice that physical transformation on campus, but we are not done because the campus center next phase is the dining hall, as we all lovingly know it, the nest. And if you look at this picture, right, look at that big, the big picture, that is what, ladies and gentlemen, is known as a hotline, okay? It is bean burrito day, and here's your bean burrito, move it along. Believe it or not, most colleges and universities have evolved past the hotline. And our amazing dining staff does a lot in this space to customize, and you can get your burger with whatever kind of cheese you want and all that stuff, but it's limiting giving the facility. And on a tour, watching what you're gonna eat and where you're gonna eat it and what the community is like, I will say this is not showing well for us. And so I'm very pleased to say that this summer, we will start the next phase of the project, which is to renovate the dining space into a modern food court, finished cook to order. Uh, we're gonna change the, the flow of the space and push the seating all the way out to the windows and put a new stairwell on the building and a new kitchen and all the stuff is gonna start to happen. So a lot more transformational change at Otterbein for the good of our students. Now, how are we gonna do that? Well, we raise money, right? And here's the good news. We are coming out of a fiscal year in which, look at that big, tall, nearly $7 million line. And this is not even in a campaign or anything particularly special. It's just that we're seeing our alumni, our friends, our supporters come around and help Otterbein because someone helped with them when they were here and now they want to pay it forward. And we've done a study of the potential of our donor portfolio. I'm looking at Mike and Dan when I say this. Thousands of alumni out there able to have capacity to help that we're going to be going to to do things like the Campus Center and build our endowment because we are on a roll in this regard and we'll building, be building on that. You'll also notice a change on campus in the student body. Not just that they are different people than you were here. I understand when you were here there were different students than there are now. That is technically true. But also the case that the student body itself is evolving. This is our new student class that started just a few weeks ago. 
You'll notice in the bottom left corner, there's a goofy guy in a robe wearing a big 80s rapper medallion. That would be me. Um, hanging out with the, with the new class before they march down for the new student convocation. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most diverse class in Otterbein history, 35% students of color. And it always knocks alums' socks off when we share that information because we hear stories, like we just heard a second ago from Eunice, that she was one of 12 students of color on the entire campus. 35% students of color. This is a demonstration of intentional work that one, we believe our classrooms are better classrooms and learning environments with a diverse group of students in them, right? Different backgrounds, different religions. You want that in a classroom, it's a more dynamic environment. Everyone comes from the same place, it's not a very dynamic environment. This is a dynamic environment. It's also the case that this means our partnerships with Columbus City Schools, other urban school districts are working. It means that the word is spread, that we're a welcoming campus community. And it means that our need-based financial aid program, if you are Pell Grant and Ohio College Opportunity Grant eligible, so about a family income of $60,000 or less, Otterbein will meet your full need for tuition with no loans. That's where this comes from. This is not an accident. And by the way, it's something we have to be on top of for a variety of reasons. We're also proud that retention is right back to pre-pandemic levels. Last year's first year students retained a little over 82%, which if you look in the pandemic, I'm just gonna be honest with you all, pandemics are not fun on college campuses. All the stuff we do about personal connection and community and bonding, when you have to be six feet apart, it's a little hard. And so we saw a dip during the pandemic but we're now back. And I can't imagine a better measure of success for an institution than whether our students vote with their feet by staying or leaving. And so they're back to staying. And not only is this overall, I would point out that right around the 82 to 83%, between 79% and 86%, all of our student groups landed. Students of color, uh, Columbus City School graduates, first generation, Pell eligible, they're all in this range within a few percent of that. It is not just some students that succeed here. We found a way to help them all succeed, and there's nothing more Otterbein than that. This is the size of those new student classes, and you can see all sorts of ups and downs and whatever on here. The big down is the fall of 20, which was the height of the pandemic, right? And you want to talk about a kick to the teeth, that's pretty well a kick to the teeth. We couldn't do sports, we couldn't do half of our classes in person, we couldn't do fraternity and sorority recruitment, we couldn't do all the stuff, and so that was a smaller class. They're still with us now as seniors. You can sort of take a snapshot of the last four years, and that's more or less the undergraduate student body, plus or minus some transfer students. But you can see we bounced back, and you know, sort of hung around the same spot. It's about 10 down a year. And this is part of a wider trend that is prompting us to know we have to try some new things. We have to evolve in some new ways. We know we're down in men. This is across all of higher education. The men in a, uh, I will just say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll all agree with me, women are smarter than men as a general rule. This includes 18-year-old men and women. 18-year-old men are much more likely to be tempted by the manufacturing job that has a $5,000 sign-on bonus, and they'll skip college, for better or for worse. Women are more likely to stick to it and stay in college, and so we're seeing that trend across higher ed. We're seeing it here. We are 66% female on campus now, and that's not necessarily because of growth in women. It's because of loss in men. And so this is a problem, I think, for all of higher education and society that this is happening. Also, international students. We couldn't really do much with international students during the pandemic, and we're trying to rebuild that population as we go. So we know what's missing, where we are and getting back to 600 or so in a new student class. But here's the core problem. There are not enough 18-year-olds in Ohio. And I'm here to tell you all, it is your fault. <laughs> you didn't have enough kids. For some of you, there is still time. Get on that. For some of you, that it's too late for you, call your kids and say, I need more grandkids. Otterbein needs them. It's not just me that wants grandkids. We need to do this together. And so turn this thing around because we are a demographically shrinking state surrounded by shrinking states. There are not enough 18-year-olds to go around. It's a highly competitive environment. And if your bread and butter is 18-year-olds, you don't love this chart, right? So we have to do some new things here to be competitive. These are our top, what we call cross-app competitors. We know where our students, when they apply here, where they also apply. What is it you notice about these schools? Big state schools. 20 years ago, 
our top cross-app competitors would have been schools like us, Ohio Wesleyan and Denison, even maybe Capital. I mean, like, maybe. I don't know. Our top 10 cross-app competitors, eight of them are big publics. We don't compete with small privates. We compete with big publics. And that's bad news in that these publics get the big fat thumb of the state on the scale of competition through big state subsidies that we don't get. But the good news is we're different than them. These are fine institutions. I'm not knocking these institutions, but we are meaningfully different than them, and we can do a better job of articulating what that looks like. The first way we're doing that is we launched a year ago Otterbein Ready. This is a guarantee that every student will have an experiential learning opportunity. I talked about this a little last year if you are there, and I'll do the brief version. The moment you set foot on campus, you get a mentor, an academic and career map, and you get to understand what you're going through and why. Sophomores go through a career and vocational boot camp. They meet with alumni like you from fields and get to know what it's like and build that network. Juniors have to, to graduate, required to do an internship or study abroad or another immersive experience. You have to apply what you learned. That makes us different. Not every school can do that. And then seniors have a thing we're calling adulting 101, for lack of a better term. Here's how health insurance works. Here's personal financial management. Here's media literacy, how to tell when the cable news might be lying to you, hypothetically. Um, these sorts of things you're going to need, the on-the-ground practical experiences. Our faculty teach as they should at a 30,000-foot level. They're teaching the theory. We're going to bridge that to the practice for our students and make sure they're equipped for career and life success right out of the gate. That will make us different. Big schools can't make those sorts of guarantees. Big schools can't say you're going to have an internship before you graduate. We can pull that off with your help. The other thing we recognize is you can go to a big school and watch sports or you can come to Otterbein and play sports. <laughs> and I have kids at home, 17, 14, and 11, who play their sports, you know, since they're five. My 17 year old's been playing soccer since he was five. He's on the varsity high school team. He loves it. And the idea of just being done is sort of a bummer. But he'll also tell you, I don't want to go to some D1 school where all I do is play soccer. I want to have a whole student experience. And I want to be an engineer. And I want to, like, D3 athletics is what college athletics was supposed to be. This D1 stuff is totally corrupt, in my opinion. D3 sports is where it's at. And so we can tell these students you can come here and have these experiences. And that's not the only reason they come here, but the, the ability to still play tennis or be in some of these extracurricular, I would call them co-curricular activities, is a driver to picking a small school where you can actually have these experiences. So that's sports in general, where a third of our student body is recruited as student athletes. It's also the case that we're going to add women's wrestling. Yes, women's wrestling is a thing. It's a big thing at high schools right now. We are one of the first 50 or so schools in the country to add women's wrestling. We expect to have 22 women's wrestlers on campus by fall, by next fall, in the first year. And so this is a big deal for us. We launched men's wrestling a few years ago. It's been a big winner in terms of bringing some of those students. So women's wrestling is coming to town. Very exciting. We're also launching eSports. <laughs> yes, that's a thing too. And in fact, while we're early to the women's wrestling game, we are late to eSports. We are the last member of our athletic conference to add eSports, the last of the OAC to do it. And so eSports, I got to say, mostly my kids don't listen to me when I talk about work stuff, or maybe in general. They might not listen to me at all. I don't know. But when I mentioned eSports at home, my 11-year-old about came out of his chair. Otterbein's going to have eSports? I'm going to Otterbein. <laughs> all about it. He's our gamer. And this speaks to a group of students, just like tennis or volleyball would to other students, that they want this experience, they want this competitive experience, this is important to them, we can tie it with our computer science program and do some interesting stuff together, and so eSports is coming to Otterbein. The marching band. The marching band is a great program. We have not really done much external recruiting in the past, and so we're hiring a full-time assistant band director and recruiter so that our band can go from 50 or 60 students that we sort of recruit when they get here to a 100 plus strong marching band, just like a sport, right? It's not the only reason they come here. They don't all major in music for better or for worse. Sorry, Mort. But like, I mean, it's a great experience. And they want to keep playing their instrument and keep doing that. So we're increasing the size of the band. We're also focused on the equine team. If you haven't ever been there, go by Spring Road and check out the Equine Center. It is second to none and awesome. We also have a three year in a row running national champion dressage equine team. They're awesome. About 60 students on the team. We're going to have a 100 plus equine team member because we're hiring a part-time person that's going to go to horse shows and build this up. Co-curricular stuff. 
big schools can't touch this. Only we can do this. STEM. We have grown as quite a STEM reputation at Otterbein. We are becoming like the liberal arts school, but it has a really emphasis of amazing STEM programs. And so many of our programs are very full, but we have capacity in things like physics and chemistry and some other programs. And so likewise, we're going to hire a specialist in STEM to help students see what the opportunities are in STEM at Otterbein to make sure that we're maximizing that potential thanks to the great faculty and facilities that we have. Nursing. We heard all about the nursing program, Barbara, an amazing nursing program that we have. Nursing was hurt by the pandemic. You couldn't turn on the news without hearing a story about um, some disheveled nurse who's sleeping in the garage to not expose their family to what he or she was exposed to at the ER, and it, it hurt the profession. There are not enough people in the nursing pipeline, and our nursing program is amazing, but it has capacity. Our nursing program is unique in its hands-on, applied experiences from the first day you set foot on campus, including all of our amazing technology and manic and stuff like that. So we're going to focus on that and make sure that we're maximizing the nursing program. All of these things came from the Innovation Fund. These were all grassroots ideas. This wasn't me getting up in the morning and saying, I know, we need an eSports team. This was ideas from the campus community with some startup funds to make things happen. And that's an Otterbein way to do it, is that we can do these things together and we're going to, now this is a part of our regular process and a regular budget that we'll always be innovating, always trying new things through an annual innovation fund process. I will also mention adult learners. You saw the decrease in the number of 18 year olds. It's a problem. There are 45 million Americans with some college and no degree. You want to talk about a missed opportunity? These are Americans who thought, I'm going to get a college degree, but somehow life got in the way, right? You know, life happens and they never quite finished. And what a missed opportunity for them, for their families, for the workforce, for their communities, for the society as a whole. So we have partnered with Antioch University, which does all adult learning. They have 4,000 adult students on five campuses, graduate programs, adult degree completion programs, certificate programs, and as of June 30th, Antioch University is our graduate school. And so we are now going to be leveraging what had been Otterbein programs into Antioch's locations, Antioch programs into Westerville. So if you were here over the summer, you would have seen three or 400 Antioch graduate students on our campus doing their two-week residencies. As we're going to be part of this adult market in a way that doesn't disturb our 18 to 22-year-olds. In fact, it enhances it. We're never going to give up on the 18 to 22-year-olds, even if they keep shrinking, right? But we're going to enhance their experience because we're talking about like our undergraduates in environmental science can go to an Antioch campus in Keene, New Hampshire for a semester and be in the woods of New Hampshire as environmental science students. These sorts of accelerated degree opportunities, three plus twos to get your master's degree in five, these things will make us different with the 18 year olds as well. This is called the Coalition for the Common Good. This is a national university system that we're now talking to about 15 other schools about potentially joining. So expect this to be two members, then three, then four, then five, until we have together transformed what American higher education looks like. And it's not about elitism and prestige. This isn't going to make us higher in some stupid magazine ranking, but it serves deserving students who are not well served by our current system. And that's what we've always done at Otterbein, and now we're going to go national with it, because there are lots of people to be served. These are some of the programs we're launching. We're already out the gate with an EDD program and with a clinical mental health program coming to Central Ohio, already advertising, already getting classes going for these, already have employer partners in place for those. And you can see joint MBA programs, Masters of Education, Allied Health. This is programs that had been in Westerville going to Seattle, going into LA, and programs that had been in LA or New Hampshire coming to Central Ohio. And we have at least three or four years of plans of launching these programs in all sorts of directions. And that's before we add a third member and their programs to the mix. So we can serve thousands of more students. That is great as a mission. It's also great as a way to sustain what Otterbein is by serving the growth part of the market, which is adult learners. So back to my little plant analogy. <laughs> Last spring, one of the big trees in front of Towers Hall fell down. You might be able to see in here. Came up root ball and all, four o'clock on I think a Thursday afternoon. Fell right on a sidewalk where luckily no one was. 
And it wasn't rainy or windy or anything. It just decided this tree woke up that morning and thought, this is it, I'm done, and just fell over. I don't know why. That tree was over 100 years old. Think about what that tree had seen on this campus, sitting in the Towers Hall lawn for over 100 years. How many students had been underneath its shade? How many graduates had taken pictures underneath it with their robes? What that tree had seen. And so, you know, it's just a tree. That's a little sad. Like, change can be hard and change can be sad. Two years ago, I was part of the group that uh, went out to the Equine Center, a bunch of our environmental science and other sort of volunteer students that went out and planted these trees. We needed a windbreak by equine. The wind comes over the prairie there and is pretty bad. And these were seedlings when we put them in. And this is a couple years later, so they may be three or four feet tall now. I probably won't see, and the students that helped us plant these trees probably won't see, these become the 100 foot tall windbreak trees that they will eventually become. This is the nature of our work at Otterbein. This is the nature of our work as educators. We rarely get to see the full fruit of our labor. We get to invest now in young people and adult learners, know they go off to do great things. Sometimes they come back and get alumni awards for the great things that they do. But we don't get to see the full fruits of our labor. But we still do it because we are playing the long game. We are playing the long game of 176 years at a time. This is not 10 years at a time, or 20 years at a time, or one student at a time. This is generational work to transform lives and families and communities. And so you plant seedlings now, knowing they'll grow into big things in the future. You can take an aerial picture like that every day, and if you pay close attention, it'll be a little different every day. It's a little different. Something will have shifted, new people in the picture passing on sidewalks. We change the roof on Towers Hall every now and then, right? Little differences. You'll never walk up and suddenly Otterbein's vastly different. But little changes at a time is what makes this place work, makes it sustainable, and makes it possible to transform lives. And if we think about those trees we're planting now, those seedlings we're passing now, they're in great solid soil. This place already has that. We just need to make sure they have water and light. And that's what our faculty and staff do every day. That's what our students do every day. That's what our donors do every day, is bring the water and the light so that those seedlings can grow, so that we may never see them, but they will transform our communities for years to come. So thank you all for being part of that and being part of Otterbein, and thanks for being here today.